just like to introduce Matthias Craig. Uh, he went to uh, Berkeley and MIT with me, and it's my pleasure to welcome to Google and uh, listen to his talk about blue energy. Thanks, Steve. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, I just want to thank Steve for inviting me here today and thank Google and welcome you all for coming. And also like to welcome my friend Bailey, who's in Seattle or Kirkland, with teleconferencing in. Um, first of all, I, I just wanted to ask you all a question. How many talks about wind power have you guys had here over the last year? You had a few? Couple? None? What's that? Not about wind? Okay. That's a pretty hot <gasps> topic this oh. right now, so I was just wondering about how many people just know just about it, how many people have seen other talks on it. Um, I thought I'd start by just jumping the gun and answering the question why most of the wind turbines in the Altamont Pass don't turn, because that is invariably, for people in California, within like five minutes of my talk, the question comes up right away. But those things don't ever seem to work. They never spin, even when it's very windy. I drive through there all the time on 580, and they never work. So the short answer to that question is that most of those wind turbines, and this is unrelated to this talk, really, but I thought I'd just start with it. Uh, most of those wind turbines were put in around 1980 when there was a heavy Tax, a tax structure that was heavily in favor of wind power. So a lot of people invested in wind power. The technology was not mature at all. In fact, some people compared to it to just taking helicopter blades off a helicopter and slapping it on a generator and seeing if it would work as a wind turbine. Um, that technology didn't work very well. Uh, most of those wind turbines never worked more than a month or two in the first place. And the companies went bankrupt, and the turbines have stood there ever since. So it's not really a reflection of wind power as a viable technology. And that should be just kept in mind, that the new wind turbines are working much, much better. Anyways, on to what I'm here to talk to you about, which is Blue Energy, um, a nonprofit organization that I started in 2003, focusing on micro wind. So it's nothing like what you see in the Altamont Pass. These are wind turbines. Well, we're currently building between 8 and 12 foot diameter rotors up here. This is an 8 foot model right here. This is about 500 watts. The 12 foot model is about a 1 kilowatt machine. The project that we're doing is actually in Nicaragua. We're a very dispersed organization. We have, we're headquartered here in San Francisco. Um, we also have a sister organization in France called ELDE, or Blue Energy France. And all of our project work is in Nicaragua. Not only is it in Nicaragua, but we're, on, we're even on the remote side of Nicaragua, which is the Caribbean side. Um, the country is, in terms of civil infrastructure, culture, and everything, is very different from the Pacific um, to the Caribbean side. We're on the Caribbean side, very remote. Now, what Blue Energy does is we provide a low cost, sustainable solution to the energy needs of marginalized communities through the construction, installation, and maintenance of hybrid wind solar energy systems. We build the systems locally in Bluefields, Nicaragua, on the Caribbean coast, um, in order to, to be able to work building the local capacity to maintain the systems. If you can build it, you can maintain it. Um, also, it's, it's a social effort, so there's an element of economic development, providing jobs to people in an area where it's desperately needed. Um, the reason why we're in Nicaragua, like what brings us to one of the most remote places in the world, is, is family history. Um, my mother was a linguist, is a linguist, uh, working on an indigenous language on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, the Rama language. Um, she documents dying languages and is a specialist in Amerindian languages. So we used to travel there pretty frequently when we were young, my brother and I. So that's how we got to know the area. 
because it's not so obvious how somebody from Oregon who lives in California would have any relationship with the Caribbean coast. My interest in wind power started when I was an undergraduate student at Berkeley. Uh, I was a civil engineering major, but I spent a lot of my time studying and working with the Energy and Resource Group, headed by Dan Kamen and Dick Norgart, among other people. Uh, as Steve said, I, I went on to MIT and did graduate work. My studies were never actually in wind power specifically. That was always more of a hobby on the side. But I was studying engineering and, and learning a lot of relevant stuff. Uh, when I was at MIT, that's where the idea for Blue Energy came. Um, there was a class in the media lab called Development on, Developmental Entrepreneurship, taught by Sandy Pentland, founder of Digital Nations and former head of the media lab at MIT. And that class, the, the whole concept was to develop business plans to deliver products or services to the world's two billion poorest instead of products for you know, the, the, the top of the pyramid, as most consumer products are. Um, the deliverable for this class was a business plan to be submitted to the MIT 50K entrepreneurship competition. Uh, we, we entered in the fall uh, in the warm-up competition, in the 1K warm-up competition, and we won in the global markets category, um, which came as a surprise to us. We were very excited. We were, we, everybody around us was huge biotech companies and all these other things. So we sort of slid in there and won the global markets category. That was a small prize in terms of money. It was $1,000. Um, you can't really do anything with that. But just in terms of momentum, that was a big push for us to get us out the door, out of school. So then when I graduated, I went on to incorporate Blue Energy as a, as a 501c3 public charity, um, tax exempt organization. And the reason for that, because I say with a twist, because we're, we're not like most nonprofit organizations. We, we're into manufacturing, so we're into hardware. And that's a pretty rare domain for nonprofit organizations. Uh, and people look at us, here we are building energy systems installing energy systems, why can't you make a profit doing that? So why wouldn't you incorporate as a for-profit? And the answer to that question is that we chose to be committed to Nicaragua at the beginning of the project in one of the remote places, most remote places in the world. It's very, it's very difficult business environment. It's not a great market. It's not where you would go if you were for-profit. And if we had shareholders, they would they would force us to go to Mexico or some other place where these systems would be applicable, and, but where there's a lot more money for people to buy them commercially. So that's why I say public charity with a twist. And that's, we, the original business plan competition that was submitted to the MIT, the MIT uh, competition was, was actually a for-profit model. Um, but after more groundwork in Nicaragua, studying studying the market and talking with some potential investors. Basically, it came up that the project was just too high risk from a social perspective, political perspective, uh, technological perspective. Pretty much no private investment would come in. Where we stand today is that we have four energy systems in communities on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. We're also conducting an ongoing market study and environmental impact study, and also, very importantly, a wind resource study to see what the energy production potential is in the region for, for small-scale wind power. There have been industrial-scale studies done by SWIRA of the United Nations and NREL here in the United States of Nicaragua. But as is usually the case, the Caribbean coast is almost completely ignored. And where they did actually study it, they were only studying things at 150, 200 feet. Today, we're a pretty small organization. But I think we're on the verge of something big. <laughs> We've finally gotten the interest and the attention of the, the government of Nicaragua. After we, we got to Nicaragua in, in June 2004. So we've just sort of been plodding along. 
Um, with the government change at the end of 2006, with the Sandinistas coming back into power, um, they have a much stronger interest in rural development. And we're all of a sudden being invited to meetings at the Ministry of Energy and, and everything. So I think, and also the United Nations and the World Health Organization is starting to take note. Um, pretty much everybody who, who has a development project they want to do in that region but very few of them have any experience with energy. So you, know, you want to build a rural health clinic out in the middle of nowhere. First thing you have to ask is how are you going to get clean water and how are you going to get, how are you going to get power? So what makes us different from other energy development projects? I would say that the number one thing is our commitment to a lasting, long-term solution. It's not that there hasn't been any energy development work in this region. In fact, there's been quite a bit of solar power development, power diesel, diesel power development for, for isolated mini-grids, etc. But almost without exception, they've failed. And the question is why? You know, we, one community we work with, for over the last 15 years, they've received four diesel generators. <laughs> And none of them has run, run for more than six months. Why? Because, they, because the cost of fuel is so high with diesel at four and a half dollars a gallon in a region where you know, GDP per capita is $450, $500. I mean, that's a decent salary for a year. Who can afford fuel at four and a half dollars a gallon? Um, no local capacity to maintain the systems. You know, nobody there has been trained on Nobody there ever had it, the first idea of how to build a diesel generator, let alone, and you have to have some knowledge of how to build it if you need to be able to take it apart to fix something, and put it back together. So what makes up, what are the components of building a lasting, sustainable solution? First thing is use appropriate technology. Diesel power in that region, it's not that diesel power is a bad technology, it's a great technology, but is it appropriate for an, er for an area where there aren't any big diesel shops and nobody's been trained on diesel manufacturing or maintenance? Um, you know, the answer, history has shown, the answer is no. Um, what we provide is, and I'll, I'll get into more detail about the turbine itself, is, is an appropriate energy source for that area. Second thing is building local capacity. We spend a lot of our time and effort training people. So we do workshops in Bluefields. We go out into the communities. We work with the system operators. Um, and then we also do a lot of sort of social institution building around the energy system. You can't just go put an energy system in a community and just let it be expected to run. We, form ener we work with the communities to form energy commissions, which have operators to do the sort of the technical operation of the system, and then a treasurer to collect, say, charging fees. I mean, a lot of times though, that infrastructure isn't in place in these rural communities. There aren't any banks. There aren't any. So who's going to take records of who's charging their battery when, who's paying, who's collecting? All the management that surrounds an energy system. And thirdly is, is our long-term commitment. Um, most energy development projects are pretty fleeting. It's either the government or it's some, or it's oftentimes in, the, in this region, it's a church in the United States, you know, well-intentioned, but they raise $5,000 from, from members of the church. They go down on a one-week mission of goodwill, buy a bunch of equipment, go install it out in the jungle, and then they're disappointed when they come back six months later, and none of it's working. So we've We've had a long-term commitment to that area over the last 20 years, and we've been now in Bluefields permanently for the last three years, and we plan on Blue Energy being there forever. Uh, whether it's us or not remains to be seen, but it's, the institution will remain. Second is understanding, uh, yeah, understanding and respecting the local way of life. It's the Caribbean. Uh, it's a different business climate. It's a different, uh, everything is different. Um, and to be successful it takes a very delicate balance of persistence and patience. If you, if you don't follow up and if you don't 
push people and nothing ever gets done. But if you push too hard, you end up frustrating people and frustrating yourself and things just come to a grinding halt also. So it's a very delicate balance. It's sort of the hurry up and wait philosophy where you always have to be ready, you always have to be following up. That's not always reciprocated, but it's just sort of a gentle push. And thirdly is that you know, we're keenly aware that it's not a one size fits all. Um, for small renewable energy systems, the key is understanding each particular case, whether it be a community who's getting a system or an individual or an institution, you know, what are their needs? What are the, what's the level of their technical capacity? What's their ability to pay? Um, how much energy do they need? When do they need it? Why? Et cetera. So each time we look at doing an energy project, there are different variables we look at. The location, you know, physical, physical location of the system. Who's going to be served? Is this for household electrification for private use, or is it a, a public school or a clinic? Who's going to own the equipment after it's installed? Management and operation. How much of this is being delegated to the community? Um, how, much, how much is Blue Energy doing? How much is an institution handling themselves? And physical configuration. Uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that later as we get into different types of systems that we build. So the core, the core of what we do, actually, one more fact that I think is important that I mentioned is, is the state of electrification in Nicaragua today. 50% um, of the people in Nicaragua overall don't have access to electricity. And on the Caribbean coast where we work, very isolated region, 80% don't have access to electricity. So pretty much everyone who lives outside of Bluefields or outside of Pearl Lagoon, which I'll, I'll show in more detail on a map in a little bit, outside of those two towns on the Caribbean coast don't have electricity. And you know, there are several reasons for that, partly because they've tried with diesel, and that just hasn't worked because of the high cost of petroleum. But also, there's essentially no civil infrastructure of any kind on the Caribbean coast. There are no roads going in or out of Bluefields, for example. You have to either fly in or go in by boat. Um, all of our work that we do up and down the coast, we have to, it's all boat transportation by sea. 25, 35 foot pongas are slow diesel boats for removing heavy materials. So there, there are no roads up and down the coast. There's no electric grid on the coast outside of Bluefields. There's no running water. So it's difficult for a project to sort of succeed in isolation. When you don't have road, you don't have all these things supporting your work. Um, it makes every small task difficult. This here is a picture of the wind turbine that we're building today in Bluefields. This picture is a, is a fresh one. This is actually from last week. Um, we just completed our fourth installation in the community of Cacabila. Um, the, a few basic things about the turbine design itself, because it's fairly unique compared to, you know, we're not the only ones building small wind turbines. There's Southwest Wind Power, there's Berge, there's, there's a lot of other companies in the United States and in Europe. But this design is fairly unique um, for a couple reasons. Well, first of all, it was, it was the, the base design comes from a gentleman named Hugh Piggott of Scorig Wind Electric. He's sort of considered to be the guru of small wind power, do it yourself. And he's from what I call the school of heavy metal. Um, he believes you know, in using steel, not plastic, um, building things strong. They're heavy, they're robust. Um, the wind tends to destroy just about anything in its path. So if you put in more materials, it costs a little bit more up front. But the idea, again, is long-term energy production. Uh, he, along with, with a fairly large community of, of interested people, developed the turbine from the ground up for ease of construction. That was really number one. This isn't, this isn't like a Berge or some other high-tech US wind turbine where they stripped away components to simplify it. 
They really designed this from the ground up for ease of construction. The fact that we're able to manufacture this in Bluefields uh, with basic hand tools and a few power, power tools uh, speaks to that. Robustness, again, tied to the heavy metal idea. And also, the other side of robustness is it doesn't have a lot of fancy electronics. If you look at a Southwest wind turbine, like the Air X or the 403 or, or the Berge XL, you know, those have fairly, fairly high-tech electronics, which squeeze out a little bit more energy from the wind to get a slightly higher efficiency. But the trade-off is that those parts are difficult to manufacture, they're difficult to maintain, and they're liable. It's just one more thing that's liable to break out in the jungle. So, this is, and so this turbine doesn't have those features, uh, which is a good thing in this environment. And it's also, it's optimized for energy production in low winds, which means that no, you know, the way you build the blades and you match the blades to the alternator, you have to pick where you want your peak efficiency to come. And this is designed to be more efficient in low winds and less efficient in high winds, primarily because when you're in an isolated system and you're charging batteries, when it's, if it's very windy, your batteries are most likely full. So that's a less important time to worry about efficiency. More important that you get some power every day. The key design, if there's one design thing that really separates this from other more traditional designs, it's the configuration of the alternator. There'll be some better pictures later on showing, showing exactly how that is. But this is, most, most generators, most alternators are, are radial flux. That's magnetic flux. So you'll have a casing like this. The rotor could either be the inside or the outside. You have your copper on one end and your, your magnets on the other, on, in the other object. One of the two of them is rotating. And it's a three-dimensional object, one rotating very closely to the other. It's very difficult to build three-dimensional components like that uh, to a high precision in a low-tech environment. So essentially, if you imagine the inside here is rotating like this, you've got, say, your, your copper outside, your magnets on the inside. What this design did is it flattened everything out like this. So you have the copper coils in a disk, which is essentially a two-dimensional object with a little bit of thickness, in the middle. And then you have a plate on either side with the magnets. And they're attached to each other. So it goes north, south. So you're, the magnetic flux goes along the axis of rotation. So that's why we call it an axial flux alternator. And then as I mentioned before, what you get from ease of construction it logically is ease of maintenance. If they can build it, they can repair it. And what that means is low cost over time. See, what we don't like and what there's a problem in the renewable energy marketplace of talking about, say, dollar per watt, so dollar per power, dollar per unit installed. But that's not what really matters. What matters is dollar per unit of energy delivered over the lifetime of the system. If you can buy a system that's cheaper, but it's going to break in a year, you know, what good does that do you? Better to pay more, get a system that'll produce more kilowatt hours over its lifetime. So if you can maintain something, that dramatically lowers the life cycle cost. I just want to tell you, this is actually one of our towers in Bluefields, but I just want to tell you products and services. So that was just a little bit about the wind turbine. I'm going to go into a little more detail in a second about the turbine itself. But this is just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we build. We don't just build wind turbines. We do hybrid renewable energy systems. That means we build these from scratch in Bluefields. We build all the components. We wind our own copper coils, cut our steel, carve the blades, all of that done in Bluefields. Towers, we also build from scratch. We do all the welding and assembly. Uh, for solar, we do all the framing for the solar, and then we, we actually purchase the panels commercially. One of the other major components of the energy system is the power center, which I'll get into a little more detail later. But that's the inverter, the charge controller, the battery bank, sort of the brains of the system. 
And then we also build home electrification kits where one of these boxes will go in a home and provide power for one small home. Um, it houses a battery, a low voltage disconnect device to protect the battery, and some electric sockets. For services, a lot of the work that we do is system design. Um, there's not a lot of know-how about how to design appropriate renewable energy systems in that region. So a lot of our work starts with this, when we put in for grants or when somebody comes to us to say, hey, we need energy. You know, we do our studies, and then we come up with diagrams like this. Uh, we also do site evaluation. That's, that's the wind resource study to make sure that the, the areas are appropriate. Uh, that's an example of a wind rose there. It just shows you the, it's not zoomed in well enough to see the detail, but it, the general idea of the wind rose, it tells you what direction the wind blows from predominantly, how often, and how strong. So each of these colors is a diff, represents a different wind speed. The top here is north. So you can see here the wind blows primarily from the north and northeast for that particular site. As I mentioned, we also do a lot of operator training. Uh, again, that's, that touches, again, on the social aspect of the organization, that we're a nonprofit organization. We're, that allows us to do things like operator training, which, which are money losers. Um, you know, you make money by building the product and selling it and never going back and seeing those people. But that doesn't deliver a sustainable energy source. Installation work. We do all of our, we don't outsource any of that. We do all of that in-house. That's digging the foundations, pouring foundations, anchors, building and assembling towers out in the field. And then also maintenance, which again, we do some. I mean, here are two of our technicians, and here are three local guys. So we do some of the work, but we try to get them involved as much as possible. And over time, the idea is that'll move more and more towards the communities themselves as once they've received the training. Just a couple key points I wanted to touch on, just really briefly, history of Nicaragua. Why is that region, why is there no civil infrastructure on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua? Why is it so remote? Basically, it starts with the fact that Nicaragua was colonized by the Spanish and the English at the same time. Spanish on the Pacific side, English on the Caribbean side. The way that went, Basically, the Caribbean side never, has never felt that it was really part of the national government. And it actually wasn't until about 1900, with the help of the US Marines, that the Pacific side, the central government in Managua, invaded the Caribbean side to, what do they say, realign it or reappropriate it or something. But the Caribbean coast really views it as a, just an invasion, where they were integrated. And that's where you get really the forming of Nicaragua as, as, a, as one country. But that didn't change the fact that people in the Caribbean never saw themselves as part of the national government. Uh, this manifests itself in a lot of ways. I mean, for example, just demographics. The, the Caribbean side, the English and the Spanish pursued very different policies. On the, on the Pacific side, the Spanish pretty much decimated the local population. Um, therefore, the people you have there today are lighter skinned, Spanish speaking, more of Spanish descent. On the Caribbean side, the English were more hands off, um, but there was some slavery, so there are black Creole communities. A lot of the indigenous communities have survived on the coast as well. So it's much more diverse on the Caribbean side. And over 50% of the population on the Caribbean side speaks English as the first language, Creole English. Um, so, and then, after, after the US Marines invade the Caribbean side, you have a long period of dictatorship, about 40 years, uh, with the Samosa family. And they banned educate. They always viewed that as sort of a resource pool. The Caribbean side was a resource pool, not really part of the country. Um, they banned education over the fifth grade level during that entire time. So I mean, all these things speak to why there isn't much technical capacity there, why there isn't civil infrastructure. Um, there's, there's, there's pretty long, brutal history there. And then also natural disasters, the hurricanes. I mean, Hurricane Yvonne in 1989 destroyed 90% of Bluefields. So just to give you a sense of, 
of the context of where we work. Again, as I mentioned before, the fact that Blue Energy is nonprofit and has sort of a social focus, you know, that means that we're, that allows, gives us some room to focus on sustainability and not just on maximizing sales. We've actually, we only have, we have six energy systems installed in four communities right now. We could have had way more. We could have had 20, 30 by this time. And we have a lot of people coming to us asking to purchase systems. But we've sort of held back on the reins because of our focus on sustainability. We don't want to go install one more system in some community that we can't support right now. So we're, we're waiting to scale the organization so that the number of installations we have is in proportion to the strength of the organization. Uh, and just on one technical note, many of you probably already know this, but uh, just want to point out that there's a big difference between power and energy uh, when we talk about production and battery storage and everything, it's remember, important to remember that power is, is a rate. So I say as an analogy, it can be thought of as water, the rate of water flowing into a storage tank, for example. Energy is the amount, is an amount. It's how much water you have in a storage tank. So think of a battery. A battery stores energy. A battery doesn't store power. But a, a, but a battery can deliver power in an instant. The turbine does the same thing. The power, we talk about a wind turbine and say it's a one kilowatt wind turbine. That means that at a particular wind speed, when it's spinning, it'll produce one kilowatt at any given instant. But the really important question is how, over time, how much energy is it producing? So energy is really our focus. And the fact that the marketplace really focuses on power, they want to tell you how many dollars per watt, how many dollars per kilowatt, is very misleading. And we, we and other responsible advocates of uh, renewable energy would rather people focus on energy. So here's just a, f a few pictures um, talking about the different major components of the wind turbine itself, since that's really our focus. Let's start with the, um, the blade rotor which, as I mentioned now, the ones that we're carving and making are about 12 feet in diameter. So they're six foot blades. They are carved out of wood. Um, we are currently investigating some fiberglassing options, some injection molding. But still to this date, wood is, uh, wood is our primary raw material. It has the advantage of being really nice to work with. It's pleasant. Um, it can also be very environmentally friendly if the logging is done appropriately. The problem on the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua is that generally it's not. It's either being clear cut or it's either there's a lot of over, there's overproduction of wood or there's underproduction because the government bans it. They sort of cycle back and forth. After the blades are carved, we, we treat them to, to prevent salt water damage, um, bugs, dust. So sort of strengthen them. And then we assemble them. This is what the 12 foot rotor looks like. Three blades. As I mentioned, we also build the alternators from scratch, this sort of pancake alternator. Uh, we start by winding our own. We just start with copper wire. We wind our own coils, um, do all the wiring. This is set in a, in a wood mold. And then we cast it. It's a fiberglass resin. And this is what it looks like in the end. You, this is a magnet rotor disc. So this is a steel disc. This white here is a north magnet. This blue here is a south magnet. North, I mean, direction pointing in. The yellow disc is the stator. That has the copper coils embedded in it. You can see a little bit of one of the copper coils here. And then there's an identical disc like this on the back side, except that the magnets alternate. So if this is north pointing in, then on the back side it's south pointing in. So that gives you your magnetic flux that cuts through the stator. So the blades attach here. And this is all mounted on a wheel hub for the, for the rotor bearing. So the blades attach here. When this disc spins, 
the disk in the back is, is locked in sync with it. So you get an alternating. As this moves around, first you have north cutting through this coil, and then as this magnet passes by, you get south. As this magnet comes around, you get north, et cetera. That gives you alternating current. It produces what we call wild AC. Um, it's called wild because it's variable voltage and variable frequency as the wind turbine speeds up. That's essentially, it's, it's power that can't be used directly because if you, you, know, you can't plug your appliance into something that's got the voltage going up and down, up and down. So what we do is we, we rectify it with bridge rectifiers into DC current, which then gets stored in batteries and then can either be used directly as DC current or can be used as, as clean AC with an inverter. For the body of the turbine, so here's, here's the backside of, of, of the alternator. So there you see the second disc on the backside. We make this body out of angle iron, weld it all together. Here's the back of the wheel hub that's pointing basically into the page. This is the bridge rectifier box. This is where the wild AC comes out of the stator here, goes in here, gets rectified to DC, and runs down the center of the tower, down to the power center. One of the other major sort of geniuses of the design of this wind turbine is the furling system. Because with wind power, you always have to worry about high winds, especially in regions like this, prone to hurricane and other strong winds. How does the wind turbine protect itself in high winds? Like, what's the overspeed protection? Because the copper coils have a limit. You know, you, they can't produce infinite current without melting, and things just can't rotate at infinite speed. And with a strong wind and no method for furling out of the wind, these things will will spin very fast, and they would melt without any protection. So, the design, what you can see here, if you look carefully. These are the hinges for the tail vane. So the wind turbine has a tail vane that's mounted at an angle. You'll notice that it's not straight up and down. It's at an angle. So the tail vane sits like this. Under normal operation, say the wind's coming from that direction, the tail vane keeps it pointed in the wind. The wind switches direction, comes that way, catches the tail vane, and it'll pivot into the wind. But because of this angle here, when the wind reaches a certain speed, the tail vane, which is mounted at an angle and it likes to sit down in this rest position, will actually rise up against gravity and will actually fold up. And then the wind turbine will pivot out of the wind. And then as soon as the wind stops howling, because of gravity, because of this angle of the tail vane, it wants to fall back down. So as soon as the wind stops howling, it falls back down and then catches the wind and pivots back into the wind. So it's a passive furling system. No springs, no pulleys, no electronics, just gravity. So it's a very high, high reliability design. Here you can see them mounting the tail vane on a 12-foot turbine. This is from about a month ago. Now the towers, the tower, how are we doing on time, by the way? In a few minutes? Oh boy. Yeah, I still got a little ways to go. OK. Um, the towers we build, we build two types of towers, lattice towers, like this sort of radio. They look like radio towers. And then we also build tilt-up towers, which are just tube sections. We generally prefer the tilt-up. It's much cheaper. However, these types of lattice towers uh, are used when there are space constraints. The tilt-up tower sweeps through the air. All the guy wire cables that support the tower sweep through the air when a tilt-up goes up. So it, it occupies a lot of space. Um, so if you need to put something between structures, between buildings, or between a tree, use a lattice tower. Uh, here's a basic diagram showing the overall system. You've got the wind turbine here with uh, your guy wires supporting it ab about every 20 feet, every 15 to 20 feet. Concrete, rebar, foundations. 
Here you have the power center, usually with these solar panels integrated. Here you have an end user, say a household, um, that's not connected by any cables. What they do is they have a battery box, they carry their battery to the charging station, pay a fee, and then they take their battery home once it's charged, and they're able to use light in their home. I already talked about this. Talked about this. Well. So we don't have too much time. I'll, I'll skip through some of these. I have some more that I, I would like to show you at the end. Yeah, I pretty much already talked about that. This is, um, this is a diagram here of the power center itself. Brake switches for turning the wind turbine off for maintenance work. Uh, breakers to protect for short circuits. Charge controller, which is really the brain of the system. It decides how much energy to send to the batteries. Batteries sort of being the heart of the system where all the energy is stored. And then we also have a dump load. The other thing is wind turbines, as opposed to solar panels, when the batteries are full, what do you do? The, the energy has to go somewhere. You can't disconnect a wind turbine from the batteries or it'll just speed up. The, actual, the batteries actually create drag essentially on the wind turbine and keep it operating at a reasonable speed. You can't just disconnect the battery bank. So the energy has to go somewhere. So we build a dump load, which is just a, basically a heating filaments in the air. The charge controller's job is if, the if it detects the battery banks are full, it just diverts the current to the dump load. It's dissipated as heat, which is a waste. But it almost never happens. It's sort of a, a protection for during storms, for example. OK, this is just what I was saying. The end user, yeah, not, not physically tied to the power center. I guess I'll probably skip over this um, for now. If, if people have questions, we can come back to this. A lot, depending on the audience, some people are really interested in cost. You know, how much does it cost and why? And I can come back to this. Um, also, this is a brief comparison of uh, of our wind system compared to solar or diesel, doing a, a life cycle energy production cost analysis. Uh, as you can see, a lot of assumptions go into these things. You have to play with these models a lot, but it shows that our, our systems can be very competitive. But you notice, this is what kills diesel systems. Over a 20 year lifespan, a 10 kilowatt diesel system, the fuel cost per kilowatt hour 38 cents. Lifetime operating cost, and this doesn't include maintenance, which diesel turbines require a lot of maintenance. Just in fuel over a 20 year period is a quarter of a million dollars. So it's talking about communities that's just way out of reach. This is the power curve for our 12 foot wind turbine, showing power produced at any given wind speed. Uh, this is some example data of a wind resource study that we're conducting. Here's some sample data just from one of our sites in Bluefields, the end of 2006, beginning of 2007, showing average, average wind speed in meters per second by month. Uh, something to keep in mind about with wind systems is wind power is way more variable than solar power. So some months have more wind than others. We use the solar panels to compensate for that. They tend to mix pretty well together. So when there's not a lot of wind, there tends to be a lot of sun, and vice versa. This is some energy production data for one of our 12-foot turbines from February. Uh, you can see this is, so this is production by day. So you can see how variable it is. This is why it's important to have a, a decent-sized battery bank. Uh, where it's zeros, it wasn't actually that we produced zero. Those were just days where our measurements weren't taken. But overall, our 12-foot system with 100-watt solar produces about 3.5 kilowatt hours per day. The logical question is, what can you do with that? If you only, if you only used our system for one day, you would produce basically 3.5 kilowatt hours. The question is, what can you do with that amount of energy? Here's some examples. If you're running just one compact fluorescent bulb, 
It would last you 213 hours of power uh, runtime. Uh, this is interesting for, say, a small clinic, a small rural clinic. Three lights, a radio, could be either for communication or for music, a laptop, and a small high efficiency freezer. For every day of energy production, it could run all these things for 24 hours. Now, it probably wouldn't run lights for 24 hours, et cetera, but this gives you a sense of the scaling. One of our systems could power a clinic sustainably. Okay. Oh, can we? Is there any way we can connect to the internet? Uh, is this? Oh. I just want to. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, right there. We did a little integration with Google Maps to sort of plot out. Where, if you click on that. Mm. I may not be able to on the fly. Uh, that's too bad. <laughs> anyway, what you would have seen here is you would have seen this would be an interactive Google map, and you can go in. These are our four projects, our four current project sites. Um, if you click into those, the information Windows that pop up have flash slideshows showing a lot of pictures of the sites, also some video of the different sites, the specifications of each system, and short text descriptions. Um, that's really a bummer that we can't. Oh, maybe it just took a little while to find the internet. Incompatible. Ah, dumb check. I just want to maybe just show you one, because then you would, there we go. So here, we're based out of Bluefields, in the Bluefields Lagoon here. There's not a whole lot of mapping in that area. Uh, just a little description of what the system is being used for, specifications of the system. This, the system that we have in Bluefields is actually on the campus of the National Technical Institute, which is where we have our shop, three wind turbines, and a solar array. Uh, here's another example of a wind rose, again, showing this is one year of data, showing what direction the wind is blowing from and what speed. Slideshow, just showing a couple pictures of Unitech. So all of this is the campus of the National Technical Institute. We have uh, about a third of one of these buildings for our shop. There's two of our systems there, showing the two different kinds of towers, the regular tube tower and the lattice tower. Uh, here's one of our power centers. It's your inverter, battery bank, charge controllers, breakers, the whole works. Our, our entire shop now is actually powered by our wind systems. So now every wind turbine that's it's got that nice ring to it, that every wind turbine we build now is built from wind power. Um, it also provides backup power to the administrative offices of the school during the frequent blackouts. This is our office. I don't know. This is a video that uh, one of our, our biggest funders is actually the government of Finland. And they sent a, a small film crew to, uh, to do a two minute documentary on the project. And it's in Spanish, so it's fine that it's muted. But um, you guys can check this out some other time if you're interested. But it's got some good footage of the systems in action.
what you can do to get involved. If you're interested in working with us, just spreading the word about what we're doing, donating. A lot of our, most of our work comes from either private donations or from the government of Finland, the government of Canada, uh, multilateral international development institutions. Uh, if you have a personal interest and you want to just learn how to build a wind turbine like this, you can go to this website. This guy gives, this is Hugh Piggott, the original designer, he gives workshops. That's it. You can find us on the web here. And be sure to tune in. We're going to be on CNN in July. They're going to send a film crew down and, and shoot another two-minute documentary about uh, blue energy. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Google. Now questions, if you have any. The demand relative to, say, uses here is obviously very low. You can get a lot of bang for your buck, just a little bit of energy. It's primarily, primary interest, I would say, is lighting for schools. They often, like, the communities will have one public building. That'll be the community meeting center, school for the kids, and they also want to do, like, adult night classes. And so to jam it all in, they want to extend the hours into the evening. So lighting. Uh, radio for communication is sort of the new hot big one because there's no telephone lines or anything. So the, the communities we work in down south, Punta de Aguila, those Indian communities, there's no phone. So the, the quickest way to communicate with somebody is to get on a boat if the weather's not too bad and go six hours by boat up to Bluefields to you know, tell somebody something. So it makes, for us, project coordination really difficult um, and then just for living, you know. Difficult. So there's a big push right now between the indigenous communities to set up a radio, communication radio network. So actually we're doing, the installation that CNN is coming down to film in June is actually for a battery charging, water pumping and storage, and radio communication integrated facility. And then there's the whole interest from like the World Health Organization and the United Nations is often rural health clinics. So the freezers for vaccinations, and then some lightweight industrial uses, like cacao processing. That's a big one, cacao drying and processing, and, and some other light industrial uses. Obviously, these systems, you know, they're limited in the amount of energy they can provide. So you're not going to run a steel processing mill off these wind turbines. But you could do some good micro business stuff. And that, that plays into the sustainability of the systems if you can generate extra revenue from the operation of the systems. So. All right. Thank you.